All right, so today we're going to talk about the rate at which nuclear decay happens or which nuclear reactions happen. So the, the majority of chemical reactions are very nice in that they have a predictable rate and we can calculate how quickly they're going to happen and we can know after a certain period of time how much product will be made very easily. Nuclear reactions are slightly different though because nuclear reactions are random processes. We can calculate a predicted rate, so how much we expect or how many nuclei we expect to um, decay in a certain period of time, but it's really a random event, okay? so there's really no way to pinpoint um, when it's going to happen. So the system that we use to predict the rate of nuclear reactions is called half-life. Okay? So a half-life is the amount of time required for half of the nuclei in a sample to decay. So since we can't predict at exactly what time each nuclei is going to decay, we can you know, estimate and calculate the time required for half of a sample to decay. So let's just think about if we have one mole of a sample. So if we have one mole of carbon-14, that's going to weigh 14 grams. But we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon, so we have a very large amount. So half-lives can you know, vary drastically depending on the element and the isotope. Some elements have or some isotopes of elements have half-lives that are milliseconds long. Okay? So every you know, couple of milliseconds, half the sample is decaying. Some isotopes that are considered radioactive because they undergo nuclear decay uh, have half-lives on the order of thousands or millions of years. So it takes a million years for half of them to decay. So the term I just use, radioactive, that just means that they are active in their nuclear decay. So in some time period, their nucleus will decay. It doesn't necessarily comment on the length of the time period. So let's just say a half-life is five minutes. Okay. So for some you know, random isotope, the half-life is five minutes. So let's say we start off with 80,000 atoms. Okay. So if we start off with 80,000 atoms, after five minutes passes, we have 40,000 atoms. Then five more minutes pass, and we have 20,000 atoms. Then five more minutes pass, and we have 10,000 atoms. Okay, so you kind of get the picture here. Then we have 5,000 atoms. Then we have 2,500 atoms. So you can see in the first five minutes, we lost 40,000 atoms. In the second five minutes, we only lost 20,000 atoms. In the first, second, third, in the fifth five minutes, we only lost 2,500 atoms. Okay? So we're not losing the same number of atoms each time. We're losing half the sample. So that goes back to the randomness of nuclear decay. We can't exactly predict when each isotope is going to decay, but we know around the time frame it takes for half of the atoms to decay. So if we were to plot this, you know, we can have the number of, we'll just say, nuclei. And that is the number of nuclei that haven't decayed yet. And then we can have time on this axis. You would see that the decay is very quick at first. And we lose a lot in the beginning. So we lose 40,000. Then as time goes on, we lose less and less and less and less. And then our graph would appear to have reached an asymptote at some point. Uh, with a very small number of atoms. So again, this example right here isn't super great or feasible because if we deal with the mole, we deal with something on the order of 10 to the 23rd atoms, whereas this would be, you know, 10 to the 4th or 5th atoms here. So that's not a great example. We typically don't think about getting down to 10 or 5 or 2 atoms. We think on the order of, you know, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 23rd, more of the uh, the higher number of atoms. So if we look at how we use these in calculations, so rather than using symbols for these formulas, I'm going to write them out in words first just so we kind of know what's going on. So let's just say the first formula is the fraction of nuclei remaining. 
when I say remaining, after they decay, there's still a nucleus there, but it's a different type of nucleus generally. So we say the amount of parent nuclei remaining, or the fraction remaining, is equal to one half raised to the, and I'll say the power of number of I'll abbreviate half lives HL that have passed. Okay. So we could write this in symbols so we could say make a symbol for the fraction remaining and the number of half lives passed we could call that T time over T subscript one half. So that would be a more mathematic way to write that. So if I have an example like the sample calculation Fluorine 21 has a half life of approximately 5 seconds, so that's very quick. So fluorine 21 is not very stable. I can use half life to comment on stability. If an isotope is very stable, it has a very long half life. It takes it a long time for it to decay. So what fraction of the original nuclei would remain after one minute? So what we have to do is figure out how many half lives pass in one minute. Okay, so how many sec seconds are in one minute? There are 60 seconds, so there are 12, we'll say 12 five second half lives occur in one minute. Okay, so 12 is the number of half lives that have you know, occurred in that time period. So I could write that as one half raised to the 12th power. Okay, so when I do that math, I get one over four zero nine six. So there is one four thousandth ninety sixth of the original sample remaining. So if you type this in your calculator and raise one half to the twelfth power you might get a decimal and ask you for a fraction. So an easier way to do this, I know that one raised to the twelfth power is just one, so I can raise one over two to the twelfth power. Okay, and that's mathematically the same. So you can do two to the twelfth power in your calculator, you get 4096 and put that under 1. That makes the calculator work slightly easier. So then it says if you begin with 42 grams of fluorine, how many grams of fluorine would remain? Okay, so that's a fairly easy calculation. If I originally had 42 grams, then after 12 half lives or one minute, I have 1 over you know 4096 of my original sample, I can simply multiply those numbers together. Okay, so if I consider having the correct number of significant digits in my answer, I would have 0 0.010 grams. Okay. And again in the calculator, I took the original amount, 42 grams, times 1 over 4096. And in the calculator, I got the long decimal answer, but I rounded that to two decimal places because in the original problem, I only in the problem that dealt with the mass, I only had 42 grams of fluorine. Okay, so one could probably argue that well, the problem also mentioned one minute, which only has one significant digit. So if you were to use that logic and write 0.01 grams, and your argument was well, one only, one minute only has one significant digit, and we use that in the calculation, uh, that's perfectly valid, and I would accept that. So let's go ahead and put this formula in terms of symbols, okay, so we can write it out and plug it in more easily. So if I have, I'll write it out and I'll explain it. NT equals N0 times the one half, and then I have T over T sub one half, okay? So we'll say NT is the amount I'll bring in amount remaining after some time t. Okay? So n zero is the amount at time equals zero. Okay, so the original amount. So one half is just one half. T is the time elapsed and time one half is the half life. So go ahead and think back to that last problem. Did we just use this formula? Yeah, we did. 
we said the time that is elapsed is one minute, which is 60 seconds because you have to make sure the times are in the same unit, so 60 seconds times one half was five seconds. So I did 60 divided by five to get a 12. I raised one half to the 12th power and I multiplied it by the original amount to get the amount remaining after time, which was one minute here. So we used this formula already. We just didn't quite have it in terms of a written out formula here. So let's go ahead and look at one or two more examples. Let's look at 25 and the first part of 26. So 25 iodine 131 is a half-life of eight days. So we could say that this isotope of iodine is far more stable than the isotope of fluorine mentioned in the previous example. So again, not all iodine has a half-life of eight days. Only this specific isotope, iodine-131 here, has a half-life of eight days. What fraction of the original sample would remain at the end of 32 days? So this one is fairly simple because I'm not asking for the amount remaining. So I can have one half raised to the power of the number of half-lives elapsed. So 32 divided by 8, hopefully you can do pretty easily, and you have 4. Okay? So then I can raise 2 to the 4th power, and I get 1 16th. So I have 1 16th of my original sample remaining after 32 days. So number 25, I have, or excuse me, number 26, the half-life of chromium 51 is 28 days. So an even more stable isotope. If a sample contained 510 grams, how much chromium would remain after 56 days? So let's go ahead and plug it in our formula. So I'm looking for in T, how much is remaining? Notice you want, or rather, you won't always be solving for NT. We could do algebra pretty easily and solve for the time elapsed, the half-life, the original amount, or the amount remaining without much trouble here. So the amount remaining equals the original amount, which is 510 grams, times one-half. Then I need to know the time that has elapsed, so 56 days, I'll just read that 56D, divided by the half-life, which is 28 days. Okay. So I could simplify that, 28, or excuse me, 56 divided by 28, I can just simplify that to 2, and then I could do NT, it's 510 grams, times 1 fourth, excuse me, because 1 half to the second power is 1 fourth, so I type that in the calculator, 510 times 1 fourth, and I get 127.5 grams, but I need to use proper significant digits, so I'll look back at the problem, I have 28 days, 510 grams, so I could round that off to two significant digits, that is the least number present, so I can say 130 grams. Okay. So if you go ahead and do part B on your own, notice it says how much would remain after one year. Go ahead and change one year to 365 days and use 365 days as your reference for significant digits. So go ahead and solve part B using two significant digits there. Okay, so then let's go ahead and look at 29. Uh, we won't solve it together, but we'll kind of talk our way through it. A medical student or institution rather, requires one gram of bismuth 214, which has a half-life of 20 minutes. How many grams of bismuth 214 must be prepared and shipped if the shipping time is exactly two hours? So I know the half-life, I know the time elapsed, I know the amount that I need, NT, the final amount, I just need to solve for N0 there, do some simple algebra. Okay, so hopefully this wasn't too difficult. If you go on to take AP or IB chemistry, you use a half-life formula to discuss some other concepts such as rates of standard reactions. But for this course, this is just about all we're going to discuss for, or excuse me, in the way of nuclear chemistry. We will spend some time in class talking about how this applies to medicine and energy, how we can use nuclear reactions to produce energy in power plants and how nuclear decay is used in the medical industry as well.